Um, but tonight we are going back to uh, Jeremy Boudreaux's um, now celebrated series of virtual visits to various neighborhoods in Florence. Uh, and tonight, Jeremy, who really needs no introduction, our head of history of art, um, is going to talk to us about Borgo Onisanti. So over to, over to Jeremy. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome back, everyone. I see uh, some familiar faces. Everyone can hear me all right? This is the first time that I've had to welcome people in a physical space and on Zoom at the same time. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here at the library in the Sala Ferragamo uh, to give my first talk to our members and our guests. Uh, I think since March in the space. Uh, so I'm very happy to be with you, you here today. Uh, and our talk today is devoted to a neighborhood of Florence, uh, which is named after an important historic church. And I'd like to spend the next 40 minutes with you taking a look not only at that church, but some of the other buildings that we have in the neighborhood. That neighborhood is, of course, the Borgo Onisanti. And I've chosen an image for the title of this talk, which is a detail of a detached fresco that can be found in the side aisle of the nave uh, that was authored by Domenico Ghirlandaio and is a representation of St. Jerome, who was one of the, uh, what are considered today to be the uh, fathers and founders of the church. Uh, he was born in modern day Croatia in the fourth century. Uh, and was one of the earliest figures to begin comprehensively translating the Old and New Testaments from Greek into Latin. He is the patron saint of translators, librarians, and encyclopedia, and today is the, I suppose, uh, 1600 1600th anniversary of Death Day. Uh, so today I'm dedicating this talk to all of the uh, colleagues here in the library who've done so much to make sure that we can actually be in the space again. I'm just going to say out to the group, I have someone in Francis who is trying to request control of my screen. And he's popping up, I'm not going to be able to see the screen, but if you all just sit back and relax, I hope you'll be able to uh, enjoy this presentation. Uh, I'm showing you again um, an image here, which I'm sure you can imagine is found in the church of the Onisanti, together with an image of the same uh, figure represented more or less at the same time by Leonardo. This in, incomplete painting of the penitent St. Jerome uh, is found in the Pinacoteca of the Vatican Museums today. Uh, and this is a great way to get uh, started, let's say, uh, introducing ourselves to the idea and the identity of this neighborhood. Um, traditionally, the legend holds that St. Jerome was um, entombed in Bethlehem, uh, but according to legend in the 12th century, his remains were uh, brought um, from the Holy Land to Rome. So if you would like to go and blow kisses to, um, I think it's a bit hard to get there from Florence tonight uh, on his death day, but the next time you are in Rome and you'd like to visit the church of Santa Maria Maggiore in the Chiborium underneath the high altar in the Baldacan there, you can find what are believed to be his remains, again, taken in the 13th century. Uh, so this image is in a church, which I think uh, stands out for most people coming to Florence as something a bit different from the churches that we have in other neighborhoods of the city. What I'm showing you here is a rendering of the facade, which was designed in the 17th century by Matteo Migetti to uh, encompass an, essentially an enlargement of the building, uh, a raising of the height of its ceilings, and this design uh, and, and facade that was applied uh, already had to be reconstructed in the 19th century. So what we see in the piazza today is actually a 19th century uh, rebuilding in travertine of a uh, facade that we believe was originally a combination of Cape Forte and Cape Serena. Uh, some earlier elements of decoration from the church were incorporated into this facade, most importantly a lunette representing the coronation of the Virgin uh, together with a, uh, an assembly of saints below. This is what we can find in the lunette just above the main uh, portal uh, into the central nave of the church. Uh, and I want to show you what that looks like. We'll go back in time to start a bit how the uh, environment here changed. 
Uh, but this is a view that you uh, would see basically walking into the church today in the 21st century. Uh, much of the decoration that is immediately evident is uh, thanks to um, a collection of artists and architects brought in in the late 16th, uh, 17th, and even in the early 18th century um, to continue to embellish this space. This is a better view uh, of the crossing together with the presbytery and some of the family chapels that we find in the transept. The fresco of St. Jerome, produced by Ghirlandaio at the end of the 15th century, is one of two images that was salvaged, we believe, from the rood screen or the tramezzo of this church before its demolition in the 16th century. The other was authored by Sandro Botticelli, and it is a representation of one of the other founders and fathers of the church, St. Augustine. Uh, these works are found basically more or less entering into the nave, uh, at the extent in which we would have found the rude screen or that architectural barrier separating the lower nave or the laity from the upper nave of the clergy. Uh, many of those rude screens do not survive. They were demolished following the edicts of the Council of Trent. Uh, and so normally when we go into these churches today, we have a nice open space. Uh, but these would have been blocking essentially your view from the high altar. And I'm just pointing out here the, the, the pairing of the St. Jerome and the St. Augustine, because those of you here in Florence might know that the Onisanti not only uh, does it have all this wonderful art inside, it also entombed several important historical Florentines, including Sandro Botticelli, whose tomb can be found in one of the chapels of the um, East uh, transept, uh, here very close to the tomb of Simonetta Vespucci. We know that Ghirlandaio had worked for that family, the Vespucci, not only in the decoration of some of the areas of the church and the cloisters, uh, but also in the decoration of altars dedicated to that family, including this one that you can see, together with the Vespucci coats of arms here on the impost block. And the loom in the uh, upper section of that painting is a representation of the Madonna della Misericordia, together with um, important administrators of the church and members of the Vespucci family. And it has been uh, suggested that this figure that we see here very close to uh, the Virgin Mary is actually a representative of a medical Vespucci, whose tomb can also be found uh, close by to this altar in the church. I don't think I have to really explain uh, who a medical Vespucci was to any of you. Uh, he is the namesake of both of the American continents, uh, and this is due to a um, an incident which was which, which was a bit um, problematic at the time for some. But the German cartographer Martin Waldseemuller actually used his name without consulting anyone to give uh, an identity to this newfound territory in the early 16th century. So what you can see here is what is believed to be the only surviving original print of this map from 1507. Uh, which was purchased in 2001 for the Library of Congress. This is one of the earliest examples that we see the name America written on a map to describe these newfound worlds and uh, continents, rather, on the opposite side of the Atlantic. So I wanted to, again, focus on the church tonight, but also take a look at some of the buildings that we have nearby, uh, so that if you are here in Florence, or if you're able to uh, return to Florence soon, you'll be able to appreciate the history and the culture um, associated with this specific um, quarter of the city. Of course, uh, Medico Vespucci is uh, a great Florentine hero, and even the uh, bridges and the squares in certain parts of the city uh, remind us of that. I'm showing you here the famous Ponte Amerigo Vespucci, which was constructed in the late 50s by Ricardo Morandi. For those of you here in Florence, uh, you might know that this is a bridge that for the last couple of years has been under uh, works, and that is probably uh, having to do something with the fact that Ricardo Morandi uh, was involved in the building of this project. And you might remember uh, all over the world that it was just a few years ago uh, that the bridge in Genova, the Ponte Morandi, collapsed. Uh, that bridge has since been redesigned, reconstructed, and the uh, motorways here are working um, uh, normally again. Uh, but I think this is the reason that many of these bridges, it was a reminder to the Italian state that we had to ensure, especially in such a seismic place like Italy, uh, that these buildings and these constructions and these tunnels and bridges from the 50s and the 60s are constantly maintained. This is a view of the Piazza Onisanti as it appeared in the early 20th century. Uh, at the time, it was not known as the Piazza Onisanti, but as the 
Piazza Manin, and that is a dedication to an important 19th century Italian, a Venetian who was a patriot and founding father, let's say, of the modern Italian state. What you can see in this uh, postcard is a view of the church, its bell tower, uh, which at this point had not been plastered, so we can actually see the original masonry of the cell tower, which is authentic, that's from the 14th century. We can see what at this point is the very newly reconstructed facade of the church, uh, together with a bit of the Palazzo Lenzi off the side, and what you can't avoid is this um, very large monument to that founding father in the middle of the square. So it's surprising for some of you to see uh, the winged lion of Venice here on a monument in the middle of a Florentine piazza. Uh, that is again because these are the figures whose uh, celebrity is really at an all-time high from the formation of the modern state in the 1860s right up until the early 20th century. Uh, Daniele Manin, um, again, just to give you an idea of how this can connect us to history, that um, sculpture or statue is no longer in the square. Uh, but this is um, a way that we can also help to teach through the archival documentation of these spaces in Florence. Some of the important uh, aspects of Risorgimento history. Uh, so I'm showing you here just quickly a painting, uh, which is found in the uh, Quirini Stampaglia in Venice, uh, celebrating the, uh, the release of this historical figure from the Austrian prisons. Uh, and I'm showing this here to you just to remind you uh, that if you are studying art history at university, um, 19th century Italian art might be a class for audit, if not simply for the fact that the titles of these paintings are extraordinarily long. Uh, and if you've got those on a midterm or a final exam, you know, that's when you start to really uh, test your uh, memorization capabilities. But I'll read out this um, original title, and this is the catalog title of this painting for you. Daniele Manin e Niccolò Tomaseo dopo la loro liberazione delle cacce di Austriete a seguito della celebrazione popolare di Venezia nel 1848. So this is Daniele Manin and Niccolò Tomaseo after their liberation from the Austrian prisons following the popular uprising of Venice in 1848. The sculpture uh, and the, the, the monument, the statue that was originally located in the Piazza Omisanti was eventually relocated up to the uh, Viali, I believe, in Arcetri. Um, and this is part of a general trend, let's say, that we find in the early 20th century uh, many of these late 19th century monuments, which had occupied the centers of these squares, uh, were beautiful and important for, uh, you know, creating a national identity. Uh, but when it comes to our piazza in Florence, we like to use them for things. We like to have historic football and Christmas markets and all sorts of things, weddings out in the squares. So, you know, when you have one of these really large, uh, tall sorts of things right in the middle, um, that's not really conducive to what at the time is uh, increasing motorization of the city, uh, using these piazzas for different purposes. And so that um, statue uh, is no longer here in the center. Um, it was replaced in 1937 by this sculpture attributed to the Roman uh, sculptor Romano Romanelli, a representation of Hercules and the lion. Um, I'm not going to, again, say too much about this because um, even with all of my appreciation for Romano Romanelli and sculpture, I, I don't really understand the decision uh, to position this work in this particular square. I guess they were doing worse things in 1937, but uh, this is something that for me has never really fit quite into that environment with some of the buildings that form the perimeters of that piazza. Uh, again, we do all sorts of things here, so it's, it's great to uh, not have a giant 19th century uh, monument in the middle of the square. We can open that up to carnival events, to private rentals, to fundraising, uh, gala dinners, all these sorts of things. And of course, the castle offers a beautiful view across the river to the neighborhood of the San Fabiano. So I'm sure uh, I just set the chat on fire and that's fine if we want to uh, come back to the uh, decision to locate the sculpture uh, in the square back in the 1930s in the question and answer period, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, but I'm going to move on now uh, and, and take a look really closely at the uh, development of this church, which was founded by a religious order uh, that originated from Lombardy, known as the Umiliati in the 13th century, and they administered this building for the first three centuries of its existence. It was only following the suppression of that order in 1571 that the space was given over to the observant uh, minor uh, Franciscans. Uh, they will have it for most of the second half, let's say, of its existence. Uh, there is a bit of something strange going on in the early 21st century where it's handed over to the Benedictines, uh, but then in 2007, the Franciscans returned to the space. Um, what's important to understand here with this handover uh, to various orders and administrators 
is that the art produced historically in this church reflects these time periods. The earlier art will have been uh, produced in a time where this was an Umiliatan church. The later art would have been basically the renovation of this church following the arrival of the Franciscans. So this is the plan of the church and the cloisters today. Um, it has been enlarged, the ceiling has been raised, uh, additional staff chapels have been uh, added onto the building, and we can start to explore this space um, a little bit uh, more closely before we move on to other areas. First of all, just talking about the appearance of the church originally. Uh, again, what we can see here on the plan is a dotted line that gives us an idea of the location of the original rood screen, choir screen, ponte, ramezzo, whatever we'd like to call it, that again no longer exists, but it gives us an idea of the spaces uh, and how they would have been uh, divided and separated historically. And this is a very minimal reconstruction of what we think that uh, nave would have looked like at the time. It is again not trying to fantasize any uh, particular details, but just give us a general idea of the presbytery being blocked from view uh, for, for someone standing in the nave. Uh, what I've superimposed here are not only those attached frescoes by Ghirlandaio and Sandro Botticelli produced in the 1480s, uh, but I've also inserted three important works by a much earlier artist, Giotto di Bondone, that were commissioned for the Emiliati uh, in the spaces of this church. So just very quickly, what we can see here is an object that is no longer in Florence. This is a panel painting representing the Dormition of the Virgin, which is found in the Gemälde Gallery of Berlin today. The two other, much larger objects are still in Florence. Uh, one is a crucifix produced, uh, we believe, uh, in 1310 to 1315. Uh, the other is the famous Maestà, which can be found in the Uffizi here in Florence, together with other examples of that subject by contemporaries of Giotto. These would have been the major images um, positioned on the axis of the church leading through the root screen into the choir and the presbytery. The Giotto crucifix has its own interesting story. It was not uh, recognized, let's say, as a Giotto uh, for much of modern history. And then with the um, sort of removal of this from one of the back spaces of the convent, it was restored in the early 21st century uh, and is now positioned in the um, raised uh, chapel here of the Western transept. So this is a great place to go in and take a look at the exhibition of restored late medieval art. Uh, even if the environment is not really invocative any longer of, of what this place would have looked like, uh, we found a way to put this work of art back in the church for visitors to enjoy. Um, we'll come back into the church in a minute, but I just want to talk about the development of this neighborhood more generally in the 15th century. What you can see here is a building which is uh, familiar to many of us here in Florence, but maybe not to those of you joining us over Zoom. This is known as the Palazzo Lenzi, oops, this is a misprint here, sorry, Quaratesi, not Quaratesi, Quaratesi. Uh, and this has been historically attributed to uh, Nicolozzo. I'm not sure what to think about that, but we know that the family of the Quaratesi, uh, or the Lenzi rather, uh, came into Florence in the end of the 1400s, uh, really sort of uh, developed, let's say, in the, in the next century. We have early tombs uh, which show us their heraldic device of this bull's head not only in the church, which is, of course, where many of the members of this family were entombed, but also uh, on certain parts of the exterior of the building. Like many of the buildings here in this area, it had changed hands frequently in previous centuries, following the unexpected um, extinction of the male line of this uh, Florentine branch of the Lenzi family when um, an unfortunate Andrea Lenzi in 1542 was minding his own business and walking down the Via Gabellina. Uh, when a piece of uh, wood or stone or something from a roof fell down and killed it instantly. Uh, so the family sort of disappears, and at that point it is uh, purchased by the Bellini family. Uh, it is given in the 1700s to be Quaratesi. Uh, we have sort of a shop of an antiquarian in the 1800s. I think we can see that represented here in this old photograph. Uh, and since the early 20th, 20th century, it has been the seat of the French Cultural Institutes and Honorary Consulates. So you might know the Palazzo Lenzi uh, today as the seat of the French Institute, uh, I think a friend of the British Institute. We do lots of work together, especially in the celebration of European languages. It has a wonderful library. 
and uh, they have all sorts of interesting events. So this is one of those spaces which has lots of history, but also uh, offers very modern services to uh, the Francophiles of Florence today. Going back into the church and sort of staying within the 1400s, I'll point out what is uh, potentially the most important work of art to be seen, uh, not necessarily in the church, but uh, through an entrance just beside it that will bring you through the first large cloister into the refectory or the dining area of the convent of the church. And it is here that we can find one of three Tenacoli or Last Supper frescoes produced by Domenico Ghirlandaio, the same artist who gave us that wonderful example of uh, St. Uh, St. Jerome, uh, together with the paintings for the Vespucci. Uh, this was a work that was commissioned for uh, not a space in the church, but a space that would have been reserved for the friars. And what we can see here, uh, just in two views, is the door that you would walk into here, and on the far wall, the Last Supper that awaits you. Uh, if you've been on a Last Supper tour here in Florence, you know we've got loads of them. Uh, we've got medieval Last Suppers, Renaissance Last Suppers, Baroque Last Suppers. This is a great example of that late 15th century style, popularized by uh, a few earlier ones, including the Importunacolo of Andrea del Castano, found in the convent of Santa Polonia. Uh, let's take a closer look here for a minute. Uh, this isn't such a good photograph, but I just wanted to show you how it is set into the architectural setting of the refectory and its vault. Here's a better image of the painting, which shows us a convention that is adopted early on. We can already see this in 14th century examples of the Last Supper produced uh, by figures like Tadio Gaddi, for example, in the refectory at Santa Croce, uh, distinguishing, um, marginalizing uh, Judas uh, by placing him on the opposite side of the table. Uh, we have a beautiful, fictive architectural environment that has been suggested here, uh, along with a, a sort of an open air view into what appears to be a, an orchard um, further beyond. So this is really one of those treasures that I think walking down the street, you would have no idea that you could just sort of walk in and go and see this. But the next time you find yourself in the area if that door next to the facade of the church is open, I encourage you to go in and explore, and this fresco will await you. As I had mentioned, it was one of three produced by Domenico Ghirlandaio at the end of the 1400s. The earliest work can be found outside of the city in um, Tavernelle del Val di Pesa, uh, in a structure which is known to us here in Italy as the Badia di Passignano. Uh, and the last, uh, last Last Supper, the final Last Supper produced by Ghirlandaio was actually for the Dominicans at San Marco about six years after the execution of the fresco here at the Omni Santi. Um, and I just want to point out to you here with the first and the last, uh, a bit of the development of this artist and his workshop as they move out of the late 1470s into the late uh, 1480s. Uh, but when we compare something like the San Marco Last Supper to the supper that we have in the Omni Santi, we start to see some of that cookie cutting, um, very, uh, faithful sort of re, uh, repetition of cartoons and designs that were used in earlier projects. Um, so just to show you here, it's a bit more embellished. We have a bit of text here behind the figures at the table, uh, which remind us that this would have been the focal point and the image for meditation and prayer within these refectory spaces. Um, one thing that young learners, learners will point out to you when you compare these two works to try to teach uh, them about artists and the way that they work is that the um, Last Supper at San Marco has a cat and the Last Supper at the Onisanti does not. Uh, and this is very troubling for many, many children, you know, when they see that there's no cat uh, in the first one. Uh, this is an addition. Again, it's a symbol that we find used in religious art to convey, I don't know, something sinister, something uh, perhaps uh, veiled or, or, or deceptive. Um, I, I love the way that this cat has um, been positioned within the fresco at San Marco because it looks like one of those custom dogs at the airports that has just sort of quietly gone down behind someone and sat down uh, to signal to you uh, that something is wrong. And in this case, of course, we're trying to identify through this sort of uh, symbolism the identity of Judas within this larger assembly of apostles. Um, but looking at the frescoes again and some of the details, you can see that a lot of the designs, not only just the table and the architectural setting, uh, but even some of the pairs of birds that are flying in the uh, open sky above 
are actually rearranged a bit, but they are recycled. You know, we see the same groups of birds uh, probably being used from cartoons or stencils in both of these frescoes, which are separated by six years. We are lucky to have these frescoes available to us because, as some of you know, uh, most of the convents here um, associated with the religious uh, spaces, oratories, and churches here in Florence were suppressed. Uh, most of them were suppressed for the first time in 1810 and then were suppressed again definitively uh, in 1866. Uh, most of the structures were given over to state use. And so what I'm showing you here is just a variety of different um, functions that we can find now within these ex-convents, schools, hospitals, uh, government offices, military offices, you know, all these sorts of things can be found within the um, ex-convents of the city today. Uh, and in the case of the green ones that we see here, the military uh, spaces of the city, all of these uh, carabinieri and military um, organizations were basically moved into these ex-convents um, already in the 19th century. We're lucky at Onisanti, uh, which is here at number eight, because even though most of this complex was given over to the state, in the 1980s, um, a, a percentage of it was given back to the church. And so that allowed for the friars to sort of move back in uh, and live within the historic spaces um, associated with their order. This is a view from the famous uh, Bonsignori map, which was produced in the uh, 16th century, the end of the 1500s. And I'm just showing you here how different that church looked. Uh, again, this is, would have been um, a map produced uh, uh, shortly after the suppression of the Umiliati order and the arrival of the Franciscans into this neighborhood to take over that church. Uh, we can see some of the buildings along the Borgo Onisanti, which is the name of the street, as well as the uh, neighborhood with their gardens and orchards in the back. If you look at a Google view of the city today, much of this sort of open space has since been filled in, let's say, by modern buildings. But this gives us an idea that the church would have had a very different appearance historically. And this is largely due to this transition from the Umiliati to the Franciscans. This is a church that you can find very close to the church of San Miniato al Monte, up on the top of the Monte Fiorentinus on the Viale Galilei. And this was the space from which the Franciscans moved into town in 1571 bringing with them important relics. Uh, many of them still remain in the church of the Onisanti today. Uh, so I'm showing you here a freestanding church that does have a bit of a, of a convent space behind it, but it was the need of this particular order to have more space uh, that uh, basically inspires Cosimo to um, move them down uh, into, the, uh, into the city center. So it's the art of the late 1500s and the 1600s that really uh, documents this transition from the Umiliati to the Franciscans. I'm showing you here a beautiful pulpit that can be found in the central nave together with the arrangement of the high altar uh, with this impressive bronze crucifix attributed to Bar Bartolomeo Cimini from the end of the 1600s. The fresco programs that were um, produced for the presbytery as well as for the central nave uh, again are a reminder of this important period of our history here in Florence in the early 1600s when these spaces were renovated, not just the Onisanti, but many of the churches would have been enlarged. They would have been modified. And so the ceilings would be painted. In this case, we're taking a look at uh, work from Giovanni da San Giovanni, showing a choir of angels up here above the, the choir in the presbytery. This is the ceiling painting that you can find in the central nave representing the apotheosis of St. Francis together with a, at the time, newly beatified St. Pascal Bailon. So as we move out into the neighborhood, we can sort of leave the church now for a minute and think about some of the other parts of the city and how they develop. Um, I'll just remind you that the uh, arrival of the Franciscans here um, really transformed the entire neighborhood. Uh, I'll go back a minute here just to show you that behind the church of the Onisanti and its original cloisters uh, is another church. Uh, this is an oratory that was um, basically uh, constructed to have its entrance on the road behind the Borgo and Santi, which is known as the uh, Via Palazzuolo. Uh, and this was a Franciscan building that basically shared the same backyard with the Oni Santi. We don't understand that today when we enter into the church, but many of the artists that were brought in to decorate the ceilings 
uh, and to produce the art for the interior of Onisanti were also employed in the decoration of this oratory just behind the church. That is the oratory of San Francesco de Banchitoni, a very Florentine term here, the Banchitoni were the administrators of this church. Uh, to go, kecto uh, basically in Florentine means to go humbly, so these are the, the humble goers. Um, and I just want to show you, uh, again, one of the things that I love about Florence, if you've been up the Via Palazzuolo recently, uh, you probably didn't even notice the facade of this building. It's not so well maintained, um, easy to miss. Um, it's not open regularly for services. They do have concerts in there sometimes, uh, but if you ever have a chance to visit the interior of this oratory, take a look at the work that we have decorating these spaces. You know, they're closed 99% of the time, but these things are all around us here in the city of Florence. As the uh, piazza develops, let's say, what we can see here is a view of that square produced uh, from the drawings of Giuseppe Zocchi in the 1740s. Uh, we can see that some of the buildings that really define the square today have yet to be built, but the church itself has received its uh, facade. We can see that the Palazzo Lenzi is doing just fine over there on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, we know that as the population develops and as this area grows, let's say, we've got uh, modernization not only of the spaces, but also of culture. And so in 1635, this plaque was put up on the building, which is uh, really just next to the church. You can find it still there today, uh, here between the windows of this uh, small facade that contains the shop today. Uh, and I'll just, I, I translated this uh, here for you into English because I think this is a reminder that, you know, it's not just all churches here in Florence. Um, this was a decree, basically, by command of His Serene Highness the Grand Duke, the respectable lords of the Belia of Florence have decreed on September 26, 1635, that within 300 braccia from this church of Onisanti, prostitutes shall not be given residence upon penalty of immediate expulsion of said persons and their belongings and the mandatory vacancy of the transgressor's trans property for two years as according to the will of the magistrate. Um, so here's another one of these sorts of things that we find throughout the city sometimes that are surprising. Uh, they're not so easy to read, but when you look them up, they, they give you some surprising messages. So here we're, we're, we're reminded that the, uh, the quartiere or the neighborhood of Onsanti was expected to maintain the dignity of the neighborhood. You couldn't have, uh, you know, uh, not so nice uh, uh, activities going on within the vicinity of the church. As we make our way uh, around the church, up and down the Borgo Unisanti, we can see some examples of um, buildings and facades from later centuries, including these two. Let's take a look first at the Casa alla Rovescia, which in Italian means the house which is upside down, all right? And it takes that name from the very strange application of classical architectural elements um, inverted. Uh, we can see that here on the uh, balustrade, if you like to call it here, uh, of this level of windows. Those balusters are actually upside down. The brackets of the house itself are also sort of put upside down. And because it was such a um, dramatic and obvious departure, let's say, from the prescriptions of uh, palace architecture, there is a story that developed around this church, which is unfortunately uh, probably not true at all. Uh, the story goes that during the time of Duke Alessandro de' Medici in the 1530s, a resident of the neighborhood asked to put a balcony on uh, the front of this building. This wasn't something that was traditionally Florentine, and so the Duke uh, basically denied this request, uh, but in a very, um, in a very sort of uh, ha hazard way, he said, sure, you can build a belt balcony, but you've got to build it upside down. Uh, and so that was interpreted in the spirit of, of, of this, of this uh, response as um, an authorization to make an upside down balcony. And this is what we have. Uh, there's probably no truth to the story at all. We think that the building was made a century after, at least the facade was made uh, a century after the assassination of um, Alessandro de' Medici. But it's one of the stories that you still find sometimes in the guidebooks because it sort of sit in the popular lore of Florence for so much time. Um, next to that building, You can find the facade of a church originally dedicated to Santa Maria del Umilita. This was a church associated with an early hospital that was founded in the 14th century by the Vespucci family, who had historically been residents of this area already in that time. This is known today either as the church of Santa Maria del Umilita or as the church of the Spedale di San Giovanni di Dio, 
which is the current name of the hospital attached to it. So it's a bit confusing. You can find these names interchanged. Uh, but St. John of God is a modern saint uh, from Portugal uh, who uh, gains an incredible popularity in the 16th century. And this hospital complex is eventually dedicated to him. This is an interior of the church. It is another example of a church which is out of use today. We can see that it's become a bit of a storage uh, closet here for some of the art of, uh, the, of the church, of the hospital, and all these sorts of things. There are some beautiful examples of 17th century frescoes inside, but it's not so easy to get into. Uh, what you can walk in and see is the vestibule of the hospital, which was produced again uh, on the land, originally uh, containing the house of the Vespucci family. Um, and that is also the house where Amerigo Vespucci himself was born. And we have a bit of a, of a, sort of a reminder of that on the modern building whose facade was rearranged in the 19th century. Uh, this is one of the more unusual and peculiar plaques uh, that I've found here in Florence. It's not just a slab of marble put up on the wall, uh, but a sculpture in and of itself. Uh, and what this tells us basically in English is that the fathers of San Giovanni di Dio in honor of Amerigo Vespucci, a Florentine patrician who enabled, uh, who ennobled his name and that of his homeland with the discovery of America and expanded the boundaries of the world on this historic Vespucci residence inhabited by such an illustrious owner as a sign of gratitude and memory, we've placed this plaque in the year of grace 1719. Uh, this is covered by a scaffold today. Uh, and I'm not sure what that scaffold is doing there. They're not doing any work on the building, but you can't see this very clearly today, unfortunately. Uh, you can um, you know, sort of walk into the vestibule of that hospital, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but I think the reason that we start putting these scaffolds up on buildings uh, has to do with what happens, unfortunately, um, you know, more than rarely in Florence, uh, when these historic buildings begin to lose elements of their facade. And this happened uh, back in 2015, I believe, when one of the medallions of the facade of the church uh, at four in the morning fell off of the building, rolled a bit along the string course of the facade, and smashed into 100 pieces on the sidewalk below. Uh, you can still see the imprint of this, um, of this fall on the sidewalk when you're walking down the Borgo and Visanti. The work has since been restored. I believe it's been replaced with a facsimile. Uh, but these are the sorts of things, if, if you can remember, uh, more modern times as well, some of the uh, corbels of palaces falling down to the sidewalk. In some cases, elements from the interiors of churches falling down. This is why it's so important to go in and uh, you know, look at these spaces and maintain them. This is the vestibule, again, decorated largely in the early 18th century with beautiful sculptures uh, representing virtues and the saints uh, to which the hospital is dedicated. And here is a view from the top of that flight of stairs showing you some of the interior decorations. Uh, you can walk into this building today. However, the oval paintings that you see here uh, that were painted by Violan uh, Violante Ferroni are currently being restored. So we can look forward to having those works reinstalled here in the vestibule um, alongside what I imagine is the larger project of um, restoring the interior of the space in the next couple of years. One last building, again, from the 18th century. This is known as the Palazzo della Marescala. Again, one of these buildings that has a story attached to it, which uh, we think probably has uh, very little to no truth uh, to it at all. This is known as the Palazzo della Marescala because of the heraldic device found uh, within the window frame uh, in the center of the building. It looks like a St. Andrew's cross of chains uh, bound uh, by a ring in the center. And this is similar to the coat of arms of a Florentine family known as the Galigai. And a member of that family, Eleonora Dori Galigai, uh, married a French marshal. She was a um, confidant of um, Marie de Medici. And uh, this has always been you know, sort of referenced basically because of this coat of arms as a building uh, belonging to her when she still lived in Florence. She was um, executed in France a few years after this portrait was made. Uh, what we know from documents is that that coat of arms is actually of the Ducci family who came from the Cosentino in the 18th century. And it was Carlo Ducci who had commissioned uh, the design of this facade from Ugieri. Uh, so again, another one of the stories that you hear a lot, people love to tell it, but there's probably very little truth to it. 
Um, I'm going to end here with some of the hotels because this is an area where we've got lots of hotels and sort of car rentals and all these sorts of things. Uh, let's remember that Florence is sort of an open air museum, but we also have to live here and the needs of residents and visitors to the city have changed over time. This is an example of a 19th century hotel uh, produced in a very eclectic neo-Gothic style for uh, the Duke Scotti of Milan by Ignazio Villa. And this reminds us that this area of town for many years was the principal entrance into the uh, heart of the city. Here is an engraving showing figures uh, in that hotel all out on the balconies watching a modern um, implementation of the race of the Barbary horses. Uh, so this is, um, again, a reminder that that huge expanse of, of, of street that we call the Prato, uh, leading out to the Porta al Prato, so we've got two different names here, the Porta al Prato named after the city to which the road outside of the gate leads, and then the Prato, really the field, this open space within the city walls. Uh, this would have been for many uh, uh, people you know, entering into the city uh, the way that they would have approached the center. Uh, so long before we had our 20th century train station of Santa Maria Novella, the first rail station, uh, which is today known as the Leopolda, was constructed very close to the Fort Al Prato. Uh, the um, station of Maria Antonia, which was uh, founded in the same location of what we have today in Santa Maria Novella train station, um, was a secondary station. Uh, but before that was constructed, bringing you in past the Fortezza to the area of Santa Maria Novella, all trains ended here. So that area of the Prato, the Lungarni that were largely remodeled in the 19th century, all have to do with this idea of the approach into the historic center in the middle of the 1800s. This is why we also have the sort of hotels develop um, in this area. This building is known as the Palazzo Bonaparte after the uh, younger sister of Napoleon, Carolina Bonaparte, who had purchased uh, these buildings. They are largely uh, remodeled today. Uh, but we know that she died here shortly after commissioning the construction of the facade that we can see here, uh, which is now uh, proudly the, the home of the Weston Excelsior. On the opposite side of the street, we have the St. Regis Florence. This is another example of a mid 19th century hotel, Pensione, uh, placed in a very prominent position on the newly uh, cleaned up and reorganized Lungarni of the city. And the last one that I'll show you is um, a very out of place building here, uh, taking on the dimensions of a medieval tower house. This is one of the few examples of Art Nouveau or Liberty style architecture that we have in the historic center of Florence. This is known as the Casa Galleria Vicky, designed by the Roman architect Giovanni Nicolazzi in the early 20th century. We do have a bit of Art Nouveau here in Florence, but it tends to be concentrated in the Bellini or the small villas that we find um, in the area just sort of north of the Piazza Beccaria. Here are three of them designed by the same architect. Uh, so in, a, in order to have, let's say, um, um, a structure that resembles a, uh, a tower really, you know, within the confines of this historic neighborhood was something a bit different for Michalazzi. Uh, and it's one of the buildings that sort of brings about lots of questions when we bring our stu students through this area. A uh, beautiful example of what you can find more frequently in northern European countries. We don't have a lot of it here, but what we do have in Italy is quite extraordinary. Um, so this is the view, basically, of the Weir, which is known as the Pascaia di Santa Rosa, which you can see very clearly from the Piazza Ogni Santi. It is where the level of the Arno River drops about uh, five or seven meters. Um, when it is a, a low river in the hot summer months, people typically walk along this weir. Um, it was always a center for activity, for fishing, for washing your laundry, doing all these sorts of things. Uh, and old habits die hard with the Florentines. You can still find them out there on the weir fishing uh, right in the center of the city. Uh, in drier times, people can take walks out there. So it's a wonderful area to explore, to go around. And I'm hoping that this um, introduction to the neighborhood of the Borgo Onisanti has um, reminded you uh, what a special place we have here in Florence. And we've got lots of things, not just Renaissance and medieval, but buildings that come from um, all sorts of different times. So we've sort of taken a walk up and down the street very, very quickly. But I'm hoping that this is, again, uh, something that will just um, inspire you even more to get back to Florence as soon as you can. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to um, open up the talk, both on Zoom as well. And Simon, I think you're going to have to help me here, but we can have question and answer in the room 
as well as on the Zoom. So thank you again very much. So I'm sorry. That's good. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I'm just going to come in here. Um, and usual protocol, if you're in the room and you want to ask a question, put your hand up and I'll, you can share my microphone. If you're in the Zoom and you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and speak, but we'll take it in turn. So I'm going to offer off the room the first call. Does anyone want to ask a question make a comment? Here we are. We've got one in the room and then we'll take one in the Zoom. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have no idea what the protocol is. Okay. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you. I have a question about the Paskaya today versus when the Umiliati came in the 13th century, because I know in that area they created some kind of basin that they used uh, maybe for the wool trade. Um, and then how did, did that sort of specifically develop then into, into the weir and when, when was that put there? The weir was constructed, was everyone able to hear that uh, question with the microphone? Of the, um, the weir was constructed along with several mills right along the river that uh, were part of that industry of wool dyeing and making that was associated with um, that space in that Zoki print of the piazza before there was the Western Ecclesia, there was a large building that was uh, basically used for the uh, drying and the dyeing and the preparation of, of, of um, woven materials. So we would have had those things all up and down the river because of historic floods, which caused damage to those mills. A lot of them were removed. Um, and I think the weir was already a store. They see it represented in the Bon Signori map already in the 1590s. Uh, so I think it's going back even earlier to the 1300s and the 1400s uh, that you have that sort of weir constructed, not only to uh, facilitate you know, the use of water for that industry, but also to control as much as they can the behavior of the river as it makes its way under the bridges of Florence. So it creates also sort of back pools, and you'll see that that's where a lot of the alluvial soil deposits, and we've got some uh, sandbars with uh, vegetation, it's where all the animals are, you can sort of walk along the Ponte Vespucci and see um, in, in, in times when the river is low, um, a lot of land and earth. And basically that allows with a weir that we find also um, connected to a historic mill that no longer exists over by San Nicolo. Uh, that is what allows that length of the Orno River in the sort of area of central Florence to stay so glassy and placid. You know, it sort of drops into the city once just before the Ponte Legazie. It makes its way through these four bridges and then sort of drop down again. So it's, it's where the crew kind of have to around, right? They don't have a lot of river to go in. They've only got a certain amount of space here on either side of the center. Uh, but yes, yeah, those constructions are associated with the historic mills that would have been there perhaps early on. In the 12th sorry, Jeremy, that area, would, would they have well, Jeremy. built something? Sorry. Else? Jeremy, Jeremy, I was just a question about the Ghirlandaio deposition in Onisanti. The, can you hear me? Yes, yes, the, yeah, yeah. It's the figure of Christ in the deposition always looks quite sort of primitive and not really in proportion. It's so unlike any other figure I've ever seen in fresco. Has is there any information about that or? You just had a bad day. <laughs> you're looking at a very, you're looking at a very heavily uh, worked image. I can take right. photograph yeah. of what that top would look like. Uh, you know, before the paintings yeah. were uh, removed, they uh, they were organized a bit differently as well. I don't know if there were sort of architectural elements between the lunette and that figure of the mm -hmm. definition that no longer survive, and so they sort of put them closer together. But we have photographic documentation uh, that that looks mm -hmm. very different uh, historically. Yeah. So the the, the the composition, the design of that figure, I agree. He looks kind of like he's, I don't know, made out of the <laughs> hunchback of Notre Dame, honestly. And, anyway, and, thank and you. Just, I'm just going to show the Zoom as we run. Yeah, we can uh, so show everyone here. We're all here. Why is everyone to your friend on Zoom? Oh. <laughs> That's a virtual visit to the live. We're not very well lit. Um, so uh, thank you, Maria, for that. Um, there's a question on the comments. Uh, 
from Sophie Schmidt's Van Oyen, why did the organ on your stand and the church behind it not follow the normal west-east orientation? Uh, you know, we talk about liturgical east when we have to, uh, to just talk about, you know, the position of the high altar uh, related to everything else. Um, it's not always available. Um, you know, we do have some churches that follow that here in Florence, but um, many of them do not. Uh, so we have a northwest, uh, sorry, a north-south orientation for Onisanti. Uh, we have something similar in the Church of San Marco, the uh, Santissima Luciata. Um, when they had the space and they could do that, you know, they, they have other reasons, let's say, I think, in the proximity of the river uh, to departing from that tradition. They say that Luca Bernaleschi, when he was commissioned uh, by the Augustinians, you know, to give a design for the Church of Santo Spirito, uh, the idea was that all of these towers that we have very close to the library between San Spirito and the river were to be purchased, raised, and there was going to be something almost like the Onisanti on this side, a church that faced north with its facade into an open square, which gave a view onto the river. Um, I guess they were never able to buy those houses or, or do whatever. So, you know, the, the, the building basically has the facade facing south today. Uh, but the original intention was to do something like that, whether that was meant to be specifically appended to the Onisanti. Um, I think when you get to different, um, you know, sort of areas of, of, of cities that are already uh, developed, um, you know, they, they, they start, you start to see that less, um, less followed so religiously, you know, to have that orientation of East to West. There are actually many more people on Zoom than in the room. So if you've got another Zoom question, please speak up now, otherwise I'll go back to the room. Any other Zoomers? Look, I have a quick question, and I probably it might have already been addressed, so forgive me. Why is it called Onisanti? Uh, the Church of All Saints. Uh, so the official uh, um, dedication of the church is San Salvatore di Onisanti, uh, Saint mm -hmm. of All Saints. Uh, I was going to do that for my second talk. Uh, I, I had to give Simon a, a list of talks, basically, to put up on the website, and I thought I would do this closer. Okay, to fine. Today. I just uh, then leave it. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Uh, I wanted to do this maybe for the second talk, but then I saw that Saint Jerome had a death day today, so I moved it up so we could sort of celebrate. <laughs> <it today. laughs> okay. So we got one in the room now. Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. I feel like it was designed for me because I'm staying in the Borgo on the Sunday for okay. a month. So I'd be walking past all these buildings, not realizing. Um, but I just uh, apologize for my bad history. But was there a reason why all uh, why the original um, people left and the Franciscan came in, and why all these buildings were then reallocated, all the convents were reallocated? There was, is. Was it something a bit similar to the what happened in England with Henry VIII? Uh, <laughs> no, this has to actually do, I think, with a scandal. Uh, in the 1590s, and this isn't in my head right now, but you can Google it pretty easily if you Google the Umiliati, uh, you know, it begins with a U in Italian, I think we put the H in front of it uh, when we anglicize the term, it's an Italian order, uh, but basically at that time in 1571 or whenever it was, uh, the Pope dissolved the order because of some conspiracy uh, that happened uh, with, with members in Lombardy against one of the archbishops there. Something like that, but they, they really, they, they, someone misbehaves uh, so badly that the entire place, there's a women's order that continues into the 20th century, uh, but the male order uh, is basically suppressed by the Pope um, at that time. So they, in, in Florence, that was one of the largest assemblies of the Miliati anywhere. And it was, they, they were dwindling throughout the 1500s already, uh, but when you get to the late 1500s, they get wiped off the map. Uh, so these spaces then uh, are, are kind of assigned to other orders who have growing populations and crowded conditions already in the spaces that they're occupying here in the city. Okay, more questions from the Zoom. Anyone up there? No, Richard, I'll turn to the room. Yeah, we've got one here, Harry. Let me bring the mic over to you. Um, Jeremy, you mentioned uh, Napoleon's sister, Carolina Bonaparte. Am I right in thinking she is buried in the church of Paul Bonisanti? She was buried in the um, Onisanti. I'm not sure if she stayed there because there's also a marker in Paris in an outdoor cemetery, uh, the name of which escapes me, but I found both. I mean, there are people who come to find her here um, and remain um, relatively disappointed at the sort of 
non over the top nature of what is perhaps still her resting place or whatever the original uh, space of the human uh, is. It's in one of the side chapels uh, of the transept. But yeah, if, if she's still there, she's still there. She was definitely buried there. Um, she might have been moved back to Paris at a later point, but I'm not sure. I, I've got a, a kind of beginner's question because I haven't had the time to do one of the, your beautiful Renaissance course, Joanna. Um, I, I, I don't, didn't know the church when you found me. I was impressed that, that yet again there was a whole bunch of Ghirlandaio. Ghirlandaio is everywhere in Florence. Um, it's a tripart question. Giotto is everywhere in Italy, but he's not so much in Florence. You find him everywhere. And then Botticelli is much less present. So, what was going on between those two different workshops that you had with? Or, I, I'm not sure wrong. Um, I, I think that you can take a look at the workshops of late 15th century artists in Florence um, and kind of hold that up to the political period that they're living through. Um, you know, the Ghirlandaio family, Botticelli, I mean, they went down to Rome. You know, we've got frescoes of them at the Vatican, and Botticelli's in the Sistine Chapel. I mean, they, they do get around. Uh, maybe the opportunities that were available to them were not the same as they were for earlier artists. Um, also because it was those earlier artists that had already done a lot of this stuff. You know, they don't need any frescoes at Assisi. Um, that was all done by Giotto and Simone Martini and, and everybody else. So um, whether or not you just find them perhaps receiving employment through uh, family patronage and commissions more than, you know, within these, these sort of uh, large church spaces, uh, we kind of have to wait for a little bit later for these uh, renovations, you know, to start getting big projects like ceilings again. Uh, but the, the, you know, the cloister spaces, a lot of the spaces of these cloisters, you know, have beautifully frescoed walls. Uh, the refectories are, are, are decorated throughout the, the 1400s. Um, so they are, uh, you know, Ghirlandaio was the head of a very large workshop. Uh, Michelangelo studied briefly uh, in that workshop as an apprentice. Uh, and he was considered at the time to be one of the most important. I don't think that his legacy has been uh, handed down to us uh, the same way as he was perceived in his own time by his contemporaries. Uh, but he was a celebrated artist here in Florence in the end of the 1400s. Uh, Botticelli outlives him uh, and uh, kind of leaves the spotlight in the later years of his life. Uh, and if we take Vasari's word, uh, you know, he basically died impoverished without any work and no friends and all of this. I think that's probably an oversimplification, uh, but this is also the time where we find, you know, the death of Lorenzo the Magnificent, the collapse of the of the Republic, this back and forth between Medici forces, you know, after the first Medici popes are elected. So the end of the 1400s, the, the beginning of the 1500s, that's already generally a very turbulent political period. Um, if artists are working differently than, you know, artists have been working at the beginning of the 1300s. Um, I would just try to understand that within the greater context of the, of the times they're living in. Thank you. Okay, um, M Michael's got a question. Thank you. Mark? Mask, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeremy, when I first came to Florence in 1961, armed with uh, Bernard Berenson's Italian painters of the Renaissance. Right behind you on that shelf. <laughs> right, okay. Um, he, um, was it was Botticelli. You had to go and look at Botticelli. He really dismissed the Elendaya. So I never went to see any of the Elendaya at all. I said, no, I want to just read Botticelli. It was only after five years that I went into Santa Maria Lorella, behind the main altar, to see these fantastic frescoes. I said, who they buy? The Elendaya. But why was Berenson so dismissive? of that he was hooked on opening our eyes to Botticelli and sort of he was dismissing someone like Gill and I, I never understood that. Is this sort of part of art criticism going through one phase and another um, and not appreciating um, a great a great Renaissance artist like Gill and I? So I'm, I, I rather lost um, support for um, Berenson after that and thought, well, what's he been rabbiting on about? <laughs> and not not talking about that and die. So it's interesting how that you change. I, I think we can you know we can blame Berenson for all sorts of things. Um, 
he's not alone in this. I, I think what you find within his generation of art historians who are still very much working in the area of you know attributions and identifying works of art and using the connoisseurship and the, 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 sort of the world that they're living in, uh, that they are looking for those uh, subtle uh, sort of signs, you know, that a work is made by a particular person. You know, they love looking at artists who had worked, uh, for the most part, you know, by themselves, didn't have large teams of assistants, because that's where you start to lose the personal style of something. If you've got 50 people working on a, on a, on a fresco program, you know, it's not going to have that fingerprint that says, this was painted by Ghirlandaio. So I think that his work in Florence, in it, you know, the Tornaboni Chapel at Santa Maria Novella, the uh, Sassetti Chapel here at Santa Trinita, and, and this beautiful, beautiful work, uh, but it, it was never the testament, you know, it was never the, the, the accomplishment of, of an individual. And I think what you find in the age of Berenson is that they're really, you know, working to construct these uh, mythologies even of these great Renaissance individuals, right? The whole idea that the Renaissance is about individualism, um, that doesn't fit their model. Um, so because they are stenciling and, you know, thinking about deadlines and contracts and, you know, getting these things up on the wall, getting the money in, uh, you know, on the books, um, those are the sorts of things that are maybe not so attractive to someone like Berenson as, you know, the you know, solitary uh, kind of elusive, you know, Botticelli. Um, but I, I think that we've worked in modern times to correct that, that uh, criticism. Uh, that has been given to him, as well as other other figures in the end of the 1400s, who had these very large and very successful workshops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unless there's any more questions from the Zoom, going, going, gone, or the room, going, going, gone. I'll, I'll wrap. I will come onto the camera and reveal myself. Hi. Um, so just so the Zoomers know what's going on, we are back in the library. It is as it's always been. We're even allowing ourselves uh, a one modest cup of disposable um, uh, disposable cup of red wine within the within the COVID safety, but we can't party yet. So you're not missing a party, but you are missing a little cup of wine. Um, I know you'll all come back when you can. We really appreciate you joining on the Zoom, and we're going to keep this going until normal times return, whenever that may be. Um, thanks all for coming both in the room and in the Zoom. Please do remember to donate. The Institute is taking a massive economic hit. We don't get any public subsidy. So any small contributions people can make is both appreciated and frankly needed. Um, but we'll see you all next week. It's Firenze now. And then two weeks out, we've got Lisa um, talking about Machiavelli. So um, uh, see you soon. And thanks for coming. And thank you, Jeremy. That was brilliant. Really good one. Thank you. My pleasure.